Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we ask that you would speak to us today. In your name we pray. Amen. So you've ever had one of those moments where somebody comes up to you and they ask this simple question. May I have a word with you, please? How does that question strike you? Maybe it's a boss who ducks his head into your cubicle and says, hey, can we just take a few minutes to talk? Or maybe it's a pastor who pulls you aside and says, hey, there's something that I want to talk through with you when you have a few minutes. Or maybe it's your spouse or a parent or a child that says, hey, we need to talk. May I have a word with you? So we've been doing a series throughout Advent called Words and Flesh, and we've been taking a look at words. And you think about what is the purpose of words? Words communicate what's on our mind, right? I mean, even Jesus recognizes this. He says, out of the overflow of the heart... The mouth speaks. In other words, what comes out here has been ruminating in here. We even use the language of giving a person a piece of our mind. It's like there's something in here that I'm thinking about mulling over, and I want to communicate that to you. This is what we do with our words. We process what we're thinking. We we express to others our hopes, our dreams, our disappointments, our desires, words communicate. To be human is to use words. Did you know that the average person uses 16,000 words a day? Women statistically, a little bit higher than that. Men statistically, a little bit lower than that. It doesn't matter where you fall. You all use words. And with your words, you are communicating what's on your mind. But you're not the only one who uses words to communicate. God does as well. You look back to the story of creation, and what does God do? He speaks, and God said, and things came into existence. And even at the end of each day, as God is processing what is unfolding before him, what does he do? He speaks. He says, it is good. I remember when my daughter, Emma, was first learning to speak and communicate with us. And one of the first sentences that she spoke was, I yike it. She couldn't say like, but she could say yike. I yike it. This is what God does as he creates the world. He looks out over it and says, I yike it. It is good. But things don't stay good, do they? Things begin to fall apart as sin enters the world. And now, God doesn't speak as directly. He speaks indirectly. He uses the prophets to speak into the lives of people. In a sense, to pull them aside, to poke their head into their lives and say, may I have a word with you? And you listen closely to what the prophets say. And many times the refrain that is echoed again and again is this, thus says the Lord. God is speaking. May I have a word with you. And sometimes those words that are spoken by the prophets are a little harsher in their tone. Like, I see what's happening. I see the direction that you're headed in life. I see the decisions that you're making. And this is not good. This is causing chaos in the world, and you need to change your ways. But then there are other times where the prophets speak, and they speak a word that is much softer in tone. Comfort, comfort, my people. I see you. I see you struggling. I see your life falling apart at the hands of your enemy. And I have come. I have come to draw you back to me. I have a plan for you. And God speaks words to his people. 
But I love what happens as we shift out of the Old Testament and into the New Testament. And this is described for us in Hebrews chapter 1. It says, in many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old through the prophets. But, but now in these last days, he has spoken to us through his Son. And this is the way that John's gospel tells the Christmas story. It's not your traditional telling of the Christmas story. It's not Mary and Joseph traveling to Bethlehem and giving birth to the baby Jesus and the angels and the shepherds and the wise men. None of that is mentioned in John's gospel. John takes a much more cosmic perspective, and John chooses to focus on the Word. So John chapter 1 begins this way. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him, all things were made. Without Him, nothing was made that has been made. He focuses on the Word of God. And the Word that is used for the Word, if you're tracking with me, in the Greek language, is the word logos. In the beginning was the logos. And this is a weighty word in the first century culture. It was significant philosophically and it was significant theologically. Because John is speaking to two different audiences. He's speaking to people who are Greeks and have that philosophical background. And he's speaking to people who are Jews. And both of them place significant value on this word, logos. But they understood it in slightly different ways. So Greeks, as as they talked about the Logos, the Logos was the intelligent mind which underpinned the ordering of the universe. So maybe you've heard in our contemporary culture the language of intelligent design. When it comes to how did we get to where we are, there are many scientists who acknowledge that there is intelligent design. There is a logic, a logos, an ordering of how things are that is undeniable. You can't look at the way that things are structured and say, this is all random. This is intentional. It's intelligent design. And the way that the Greeks spoke about that 2,000 years ago is using the term logos. They said there is a logos, there is an ordering, albeit impersonal and distant, There is an ordering to the universe that is undeniable. But the Hebrews, they took the word logos further. For them, the word logos was an expression of the living God of the Old Testament. This was God speaking. And so at creation, God speaks and the logos reveals himself. Or when the prophets say, thus saith the Lord, this is the word, this is the logos of the Lord, and God continues to reveal himself to the people. John takes this background, this understanding philosophically and theologically of the logos, and he brings it close to home. As he says in verse 14, and the word, the logos, which seems to be distant and maybe impersonal at times, and that word became flesh and made his dwelling amongst us. Now, it's not just God speaking through the prophets and we're left to flesh that out. No, this is the very word, the very logos of God, the one who orders and organizes and holds everything together and makes sense of all of it. This is that logos now right here, opening his mouth, even as a little child, and speaking to you. Which means this, if you want to know what's on the mind of God, then look and listen to Jesus, who is the Logos made flesh. John 1 verse 18 goes on to say this, no one has ever seen God, but God the one and only who is at the Father's side, that's, that's Jesus, has made him known. God in Jesus ducks his head, literally ducks his head out of the womb of Mary into this world and says, 
may I have a word with you. Which is mind-boggling to me. To think that the God of the universe chooses to speak directly, not indirectly, but directly to you. You have full access to him immediately. This is not like calling customer service, and you've had those moments where you want an answer to your question, you call customer service, and they're like, uh, let me talk to my boss. And they put you on hold, and then they're talking to their boss who maybe has to talk to their boss, and you're trying to figure out the answer to your question. And you know somewhere in that company, somebody has the answer, and you just wish that you could directly talk to them. God has done that for you. He's not indirectly communicating with you. He is directly speaking to you as the CEO of the cosmos. As God's word made flesh. So, what's on God's mind? What's on God's mind for you this Christmas? If he poked his head into your life right now, what would he say? You. Not us collectively, you. What would he say to you? Would he say something that makes you feel uncomfortable and the sense of dis-ease? Or would he say something to you right now that would comfort you and would ease your mind? Probably. Right? Probably both. Because we need both in our lives. Here's the way that John puts it. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of, and I want you to notice these two words, full of grace. That's comfort when you find yourself in a place of dis-ease. And truth. That's a convicting word for you. And I believe Jesus comes to bring both of them to you this Christmas. Both a word of grace and a word of truth. A word of conviction for you and a word of compassion. A word that says to you, when your life is out of whack, when it's out of line with the logic that he has ordered this universe, something's wrong. Something's off. And you are making a mess of your life. But also a word of grace that says, I know what is good, right, and beautiful. I know that's not you. But as the one who is good, right, and beautiful, I am stepping in to this world and reordering it. I'm stepping into your life and reordering it. And I choose to take all of that chaos and all of that rebellion and suffer and die for you so that your life can once again find order in me. It's a word of grace, and it's a word of truth, and it's a word for you. And this is the way that Jesus carries out his ministry, with grace and truth. I mean, there, there are times where you look at Jesus, and he's that kinder, kinder, gentler, less scary version of Santa Claus at the mall. Like, the kids are coming up, and they're sitting down on his lap, and he's taking all of their requests. And he, he genuinely desires to do what is good and best for you. That's what Jesus does. As people come to him with their needs and their concerns, he is there to help them and to give them hope. He's full of grace. But then he's also full of truth. It's like the song, Santa Claus is coming to town. You better watch out. You better not pout. You better not cry, I'm telling you why. Because Santa Claus is coming to town. And what does that song then tell us? He knows who has been naughty, and he knows who has been nice. 
And Jesus sees in his ministry and right now into your heart and he knows where you've been in the right and he knows where you've been in the wrong. And to be honest, none of us is on the nice list this Christmas. We're on the naughty list. And not only should we have a lump of coal in our stocking, but ultimately we're deserving of hell. Jesus knows that. And he comes for you with a word of grace and a word of truth. Grace for our guilt. Truth for those times where we're ignorant. Grace for those moments where we are brokenhearted. Truth for us in those moments where we are hard-hearted. Grace when our lives are falling apart. And truth that reveals to us how our life is held together in Him. Jesus comes with a word for you this Christmas. A word of grace and a word of truth. As I look at the world around, here's what I notice. There's a lot of words, but there's not a lot of God's Word. There's a lot of people in our society who are trying to make sense of everything that is happening, and a lot of quote-unquote trusted voices whether it's on NPR, whether it's the anchors of the evening news, or whether it's the voices of social media. And I listen to a lot of what they're saying, and I'm like, I don't really think that you're making sense of life. Because there's only one person who is the logos, who is the logic, who is the one who orders it all and holds it all together. And that's Jesus. And we're here today because Jesus has a word for you, a word that will make sense of your entire life. He is the word made flesh. And he's poking his head into your life. He's asking a question. May I have a word with you? Are you listening? He's speaking. And the word became flesh and made his dwelling amongst us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who comes from the Father, full of grace and truth for you. Amen.